Good morning. Maurice Berman, how are you today? Muy bien, Juan Carlos. ¿Cómo estás? <laughs> bien, ¿y tú? Muy bien. Well, thanks for accepting the, uh, the interview. Let me start with the most uh, recent of your books called Why America Failed. Really wondering about the, uh, the title. I mean, it's not very uncommon these days to, to see and to listen to uh, these kinds of opinions uh, lately. But uh, why is that book called as it is? <laughs> well, you know, Juan Carlos, that wasn't the working title. That wasn't the original title I had for the book. Mm. Uh, the original title was uh, Capitalism and Its Discontent. Mm. which would have been, in Espanol, uh, el malestar, uh, the capitalism, or whatever that Freudian title is, you know. Mm. Uh, and I like that a lot better because, <coughs> pardon, I like that a lot better because um, that's really what the book was about. It was uh, essentially saying that America has two histories. One is the history of capitalism, really from the late 16th century, And the other is uh, those uh, people on the American continent who objected to that, who were discontent. Uh, you start with the, uh, the Puritan clerics, you know, the Puritan divines. Uh, you move through Emerson and Thoreau, and then later on uh, uh, Lewis Mumford and uh, um, John Kenneth Galbraith and just a number of other people who felt that that was the wrong track. And what I argue is that the story of capitalism and its discontents is that capitalism won, and nobody paid any attention to the discontents. And as a result, American history was very, very lopsided for four centuries, and now it's collapsing. I mean, it's tipping over because it's so lopsided, because it only allowed for one ideology. And uh, so that was the original title, Capitalism and Its Discontent, so Malestar and Capitalismo. Mm -hmm. And um, my uh, editor uh, in, uh, in New Jersey um, was not happy with it because he felt, uh, yes, it was a Freudian title and there was something nice to it and so on, but at the same time, it was too academic and uh, as a result, it wouldn't sell. Uh, now, I have to say, it's kind of a joke because the book didn't sell anyway. Um, and that is to say, in a nation of 315 million people, it sold something like 5,000 copies. It'll probably do better in Mexico in its uh, Spanish translation, Las Raices del Fracaso Americano. Sure. It'll probably do better in Mexico than it did in the United States. Uh, sure. So the title wouldn't have mattered, and I really wish that I had stuck with um capitalism and its discontents, he felt that Why America Failed was a more dramatic title, you know, and so on. But the real problem is, in terms of appealing to the American public, um, this is a title that they're going to disagree with immediately, because optimism and uh, a kind of mythology about America is so deeply ingrained in the American psyche that to see a title like Why America Failed is immediately repulsive to Americans. That is, estadounidenses. Sure. They, they can't tolerate this. So they're not going to buy uh, a title with that, uh, you know, a book with that title, and they're not going to read a book with that title. And so um, the book itself was a fracaso <laughs> from, the, from a commercial point of view. I personally feel... It's a great success, but that's only as an author thinking of it in terms of the craftsmanship of the work, you know, the art. Sure. I mean, if, you, uh, if what the book is saying is true, maybe it's not being picked up now, but it would be in the future. Because, uh, if, if, yeah, if, probably by Chinese historians, <laughs> you know, 50 years from now, who are examining, boy, the American experiment, this was, what a miserable failure this was, what a tragedy... And look, here's this guy. We dug him out of the library by accident. Here's this guy who happened to see it 50 years ago. You know, Well, that would be wonderful. Of course, I won't be around for that. But um, the possibility of Americans actually dealing with this 
is very small. You said earlier, Juan Carlos, that, well, there are a lot of books like this. And I'm not sure I quite agree with that, and I'll tell you why. There are a lot of books in the United States over the last 10 or 15 years that uh, criticize one institution after another, Mm. the military, educational system, the financial system, health care. Every institution has been severely criticized. But the the problem with that is uh, that um, there's more that those books don't do than what they do. What I mean is, first of all, they don't connect all these institutions, which is what I do. In other words, they don't see that there's a relationship between the failure of the educational system and the failure of the military or of the the press, the media. They don't make those connections. Secondly, what they do is they tell you for, let's say, 300 pages how awful the situation is, whatever institution they're talking about, the press, military, they tell you how dysfunctional and how horrible it is. And then in the last 10 pages, they come out with a formula for how this is going to be fixed. Mm. And the formula is usually one uh, that would require uh, somehow a change of attitude or consciousness or of direct will by the American people. Well, that, that recipe for social change has never been real. That's not how things change socially. They change because of power, Mm -hmm. not just because people decide something. And so it's the formula for the optimistic formula at the end is really no solution at all. Finally, the third thing that they don't do is they never blame the American people themselves. Mm -hmm. In other words, they talk about the institution as as though the institution had a life almost independently of the people within it or of the people in the United States. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that it's Americans themselves on an individual level that have applauded the military uh, in our various wars until, of course, we lost them or started losing them. Then they don't applaud. But until that point, they they have bumper stickers on their cars and they go to rallies. They think the military is great. Or our educational situation... Uh, they don't demand academic standards, just the opposite. They demand that they get a degree without doing any work at all. And so, finally, um, there's a congruence between the macrocosm, the larger institutions of the country, and the microcosm, the individual people. Um, No government has legitimacy without the support of large sections of the population. And so... It's impossible to sit around saying, as, as I've heard many Mexicans or Europeans do, well, you know, the problem in the United States is the government. It's, the problem is not the people. The people are intelligent and well-intentioned and so on. I'm telling you they're not. They're not intelligent and they're not well-intentioned. So if and, these institutions are the reflection of individual identities or collective identities. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. Where else? Where else would the temperament of a country come from, if not from the temperament of its people. That's where it uh, originates from. But yes, so, so, I mean, if this is the reflection of a way of life, how much do you think and how much does your analysis resemble the inclusion of the corporate state as an explanation for the follies that the United States is going through as a system? Uh, I'm having a hard time hearing you, Carlos. I need you to speak a little louder. Oh, I mean, you're saying that uh, what's going on in the U.S., can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, you say it's a reflection of uh, institutional systemic failure. How much? yes, but those institutions are a reflection of individual attitudes and behavior. Yes, and that's where I'm trying to get to. Is this just a sociological explanation, or can you really say that there's also a political, like corporate... uh, ingredient to the mix that makes this uh, tension in, at the social stage being affected even more by uh, political corporations, which, which, as you know, respect no national identity and could move capital around the world without taking a flag into account. Yes, 
all of that is real. But what I'm really trying to say is that let's go back for a moment to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Mm. Okay, their slogan was, we are the 99 percent. And the one percent is what you just described. Very rich corporate elites, political elites, moving capital around the world, controlling everything and so on. And the argument that Occupy Wall Street wanted to make was that this 1% is oppressing the 99%, and the 99% need to stand up and claim their right to uh, self-determination and self-control. Mm. And so that was, that was, as I understood it, that was primarily their platform. Now, there's only one trouble with that. The 99% that they're talking about that are oppressed by and large, don't see themselves as oppressed. Last March, the Pew Charitable Trust, which is a very large uh, think tank uh, that takes polls regularly of American attitudes, um, conducted a poll in which they asked people how they felt about the 1%. And overwhelmingly, the people that were polled said They had no objection to a small, wealthy elite running the country. No no objection at all. What their goal was, was to become part of that elite. (laughs) And so I think back, you know, we have a very famous novelist in the United States named John Steinbeck. And years ago, he's dead now, a long time. But John Steinbeck once said, the curious thing about the United States and why socialism never really had a chance in the United States, is that the poor in the United States regard themselves as temporarily embarrassed millionaires. (laughs) In other words, they're millionaires in their head, they just don't have any money. But their goal is the same goal as the rich. It's not to have a different type of society, not at all. It's to have the same society, but they should be at the top. How much do you think that this... uh what you just mentioned is part of the meritocratic system that has been sold to people for a uh, hundred years now. Well, yeah, I mean, there is a relationship, but the important thing to realize about that system is that in a profound sense, it was never real. In other words, the meritocracy is always pointed to as the source of social mobility. Mm. If you get education, if you get a degree, if you're competent, you'll move up in the in the system. Now, the first thing is that, by and large, almost all Americans die in the same social class into which they were born. What about the middle class that grew up in the mid twentieth century? Wasn't that a reality? Yes, it was, and it was a, and it was an expansive uh, reality for a time. But even then, most of them didn't change the social class they were in. That remained pretty constant. What the United States does, what the political system does, is it points to the exceptions as role models and really the norm. So it points to somebody like Bill Gates, for example. What does he have now, $50 billion? Mm. And it says, you see, this is the self-made man. And the self-made man is what the United States is about. It offers you all this opportunity. But as I said, these are the rare exceptions. Most wealth in the United States is inherited. People do not escape the class into which they were born. And recent studies over the last 10 or 15 years have demonstrated conclusively that social mobility is much higher in most of the European countries than it is in the United States. The United States is always claiming that the semi-socialist programs of, let's say, Sweden or Finland or France or whatever, the social safety net, is a hindrance to this opportunism and moving up the ladder. The opposite is just true, is is the truth. Um, That is to say, the European countries, in terms of social mobility, do much better than the United States. In the United States, really... Nobody moves anywhere. That's just the illusion of the meritocracy. I was also thinking uh, what you said earlier about uh, the book not being a bestseller, even though the title 
directs to the fact that it should be or it would become. How much do you think this optimism is really a built-in mechanism from uh, this national identity which sells basically the fact that you're the best country in the world and that you have to be competitive and that you have to stand up all the time? I mean, how, how much do you think this maybe uh, a fantasy creates the collective ego in the United States and makes it hard for people individually and semi-collectively to accept failure? Well, that's, that's really an important question. It's in a long discussion, but let me try to summarize it. Um, first of all, I have to say, just so we understand each other, that the title of my book in English, Why America Failed, would not be lead it to be a source of popularity and a bestseller, just the opposite. And for the reason you're talking about, that is to say, Americans are optimistic. If they see a title like Why America Failed, it's very hard for them to integrate that into their minds because the words America and failure don't go in the same sentence in the American mind. Mm. You know, uh, We had a comedian, he died a few years ago, but he was really great. His name was George Carlin, sure. and I remember he once said, they call it the American dream because you've got to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> yeah. And this is really true. It's sort of like Americans live in a kind of fog. It's an optimistic fog about the American dream and about mythology and so on. Many years ago, uh, a great historian named Van C. Van Woodward in the United States, he was a Southern historian. And he wrote uh, books with titles like uh, The Question of Southern Identity. And this is in the early 50s, like 1953, he wrote, he said, you know, the problem with the United States, most of the United States, is that it never had the experience of the South of being defeated. Because once you are defeated, you acquire a more subtle in insight into the nature of human existence. Sure. And you understand that life is inherently tragic, and there are reasons for pessimism that are very important. And that the North and the rest of the country, at that time, 1953, said, yeah. I mean, this is in the middle of the, or just after the Korean stalemate, he said the United States never experienced that, and so it has no wisdom. It really has no wisdom. It needs to learn from the South. The problem is that the South has been vilified because of the issue of slavery. And most Americans could never get beyond the issue of slavery. So the South was nothing they really wanted to pay attention to unless they lived in the South. And um, as a result, this notion of optimism and we will always succeed, we'll always be number one, and so on, no civilization will always succeed. No civilization will always be number one. And the trilogy that I wrote about uh, the decline of the American empire um, is just an historian doing his homework, really, because what I'm doing is showing the reasons for American civilization coming apart, disintegrating, and finally declining. I would guess that by 2025, which is only 12 years away, the United States will be in a very, very different position with regard to the rest of the world than it is now. So si. it's very hard for Americans to take this kind of information in because the brainwashing in this country is so extremely powerful. Yeah. But let me ask you, I, I mean, the obvious question Because, I mean, louder, louder. Uh, let me make you the obvious question. Can you hear me now? Yeah. People will definitely ask, I mean, where is this man coming from? Is he a philosopher? Is he making uh, scientific, economical claims? Does he have uh, uh, academic validity? Or is this just a uh, personal rant? How would you answer this, people? I would say that I'm just a crazy, wild eyed radical. And. My work has no basis in reality at all. No. <laughs> Let's leave that out. Try again. Um, if you look at those three books, okay, in uh, Spanish, the titles were El Crepúsculo de la Cultura Americana, uh -huh. Edad Oscura Americana, 
and finally Las Raices del Fracaso Americano. Sí. If you look at those three books, turn to the back first and check out the footnotes. Each of them has something, well, not so much the first one. The first one was a bibliography, but the second two books that I mentioned, there's something like 40 pages of footnotes in small font. You know, I mean, it's not like I made this data up. Um, furthermore, how did I come to it? I never trained as an American historian. I trained as a European historian and as an historian of science. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that by the time of the mid-90s, living in the United States, that I slowly began to look around me and see, while everybody was saying how great the prosperity was, and everything was exciting, and the information highway and all this, mm -hmm. what I saw increasingly was signs of collapse and decay. And I also saw that nobody else saw it. And that first book I wrote, El Crepusculo, was the result of just making notes on napkins in restaurants and then coming home and tossing them in a folder until the folder got very large. Sure. And finally I sat down and I wrote the book, and I said, you know, if you compare the structural factors of the late Roman Empire with what's going on in the United States today, the factors that led to Rome's collapse are the same things that are going on in the United States right now, and furthermore, we aren't doing anything about them. In fact, we're making them worse. Well, so I think I can claim a training as, you know, having done a doctorate in history, knowing what evidence and analysis consists of, but I just turned that viewpoint, uh, that all that training, I turned it on the subject of the United States, which frankly, up to about 1995, I had never been interested in, in an academic sense. I never wrote a book about the United States before that. Um, it was not a subject of my uh, actual interest. Um, but as an American walking around the United States and looking at things like government signs in which elementary words were misspelled, you know, that takes your breath away. Sure. Let me ask you about the Roman Empire. I mean, I, I'm going to bring up Edward Gibbon. And uh, you mentioned uh, one of the most important historians uh, which wrote about the demise of the Roman idea. And three of the basic uh, characteristics of its failure was, number one, hypertrophy, overextension, which we could see that's possibly happening around the world. You, uh, he also mentions they became uh, consumers and not producers, which is also happening around the world with the externalization of industry and the moving around of, of financial capital. And in the end you have the debasement of the currency, of the denarius. But there comes my, my doubt, because, I mean, you see nowadays that the euro, it's not really functioning as, as a counterbalance, as a counterpoise to the United States. And Asia has not really developed a currency of its own, a strong currency. So the dollar is ironically gaining uh, around the world. Do you think this is just like the last phase of the dollar, or is it uh, an, something that cannot be explained at this stage of America's failure? Oh, I think it can be explained. I think it can be explained. The strength of the dollar vis-a-vis -vis other currencies, well, there are a lot more indicators, economic indicators of failure than uh, just what the dollar is buying with regard to other currencies. Um, furthermore, over the last, Uh, two or three months, strangely enough, the euro has risen against the dollar. Mm. About three months ago, the dollar bought, um, it was uh, uh, $1.22. A euro was worth $1.22. Mm. Since now the euro is worth $1.35. So it's actually increased quite a bit, maybe 10% over the last three months. Secondly, uh, Chinese currency is doing very well in the world. I mean, there's no uniform Asian currency, but the renminbi uh, is quite a powerful currency in the world. I mean, uh, Chinese, you know, the Chinese have a huge clout economically in the world. But the important thing is that the, the
strength of the dollar regarding vis-a-vis other currencies is not the crucial measure. The crucial measure is something like that the national debt is $14 trillion and that that debt is being bought by the Chinese uh, in the form of treasury notes. Yeah, so, but that makes them dependent on the U.S. too for credit. Yeah, that's right. Well, the reason that the Chinese don't pull the plug is they want to get paid <laughs> their debt. But the fact is that they could pull the plug if they wanted to. And so, uh, basically, when the Chinese premier was last here in the United States, um, his relationship to Mr. Obama was that of, you know, like a central banker to a colonial outpost. He understood that he called the shots, and so did Obama. Um, so... Obama can rattle sabers and put a marine base in Australia to watch the Chinese, whatever that means, you know, and so on. But the truth is that it's the Chinese that hold the purse strings. So one thing is the national is the national debt. Um, the other thing is... Let, let me just uh, ask you a question there, because maybe if, if the United States is a debtor country and, and China is, I mean, it's not a superpower yet, because they depend on U.S. credit and consumption. Maybe we're talking about a multipolar world where the transfer of power is being gradual and you won't have uh, hegemonic power in China like you had in the U.S. Are we looking at a different world here? Well, you know, when I said I was a graduate student in history, I was in history. I wasn't a graduate student in prophecy. So I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not a gypsy. And I can't guess. Right now, I would say we have we are sliding toward a multipolar world in which power will be divided between the United States, the European Union, uh, and uh, China, and to some extent Japan. Um, those would be those would be there would be the distribution. But the chances are, I mean, I'm just guessing here. The chances are that eventually the United States will lose power. It will decay as a nation. In fact, uh, the U.S. Naval War College in the United States estimates that by 2020, which is only seven years away, the uh, Chinese will be more powerful than the United States militarily in the Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. And so power is shifting, and things will be very different, as I said, by 2025. Well, But... Um, The other thing I wanted to say See. about this business of the dollar and the euro and so on is uh. that the larger picture that's going on is the disintegration of capitalism, not just the disintegration of the United States. And so what you have is severe problems of austerity in England, in Spain, and in Greece in particular. Um, so although the euro is strong... It's not clear how much, uh, you know, uh, currency or importance to put on that because they are also, as capitalist systems and consumer economies, starting to fall apart. Um, what, historically, I think what's called for is a whole new civilizational paradigm, one that eclipses uh, the, a world capitalism as a system And frankly, I believe that's going to come about. It's just going to take most of the 20th century to do that. Well, But here comes my next point, because, I mean, uh, you know, the demise of capitalism has been predicted for a long time, and it has not arrived. But, I mean, if we see, I mean, taking out the fact that we don't know what's going to happen with power, political power, but we are looking at uh, the power of capital, of finance, of big money, that... They don't have allegiance to nation states anymore. They can really just move around the world and invest or use resources, and they could just live like the 1% going to and fro, traveling. If we were to posit uh, post-nation state capitalism as a reality, I mean, would that mean that the United States as a republic, as a concept, could just become a carcass and just become something to be thrown out and just capital can just move around and travel like it, it already is happening around the world? What it is already a carcass. Huh? It is already a carcass. It is already hollow in the United States. 
the United States loses economic power on a daily basis. It doesn't have it anymore. I mean, it's continuing to lose that power. And as you say, there's an elite that is transnational. It's not particularly an American elite. The important thing now is not the color of your passport. It's not about nation states. The important thing is to be in that elite class and to be able to move money around like that. So, I mean, we're, we're already seeing that uh, happen. But the other thing that, that will serve as an enormous break on uh, the power of capital in general, not just in the United States, is that on a planetary level, we are running out of resources, specifically oil. And most things come from petroleum manufacturers, even agriculture, is petroleum-based. And so what we're going to see more and more is um, this attempt on the part of countries like the United States to extract through technology the, the remaining drops you know, of resources of oil and water and food and um, exotic metals that are used in computers and so on to, to extract those from the earth until finally you can't do that anymore and the system does really collapse the system of capitalism does really collapse i mean yes it has been predicted in the past but i think we can see the effects right now even leaving the environmental question aside one out of five americans is out of work and won't find a job for 10 years so, so you, you think the books are cooked in terms of uh, statistics in the u.s Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, for example, for example, the official unemployment rate is 9%. Mm. But how does the United States publicly arrive at that figure? You include in the ranks of the employed people who were unemployed before and were drawing unemployment insurance, and then it ran out. Mm. So they're no longer on the unemployment roll, so they show up as though they're employed. Or people who work four hours a week, let's say, which is not exactly enough to support yourself, are considered employed. So it's interesting because the public government figures of unemployment, 9%, if you go online and you check the website of the U.S. Uh, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, mm. it will give you those breakdowns of people that work only four hours a week or people who used to collect unemployment insurance and no longer do. And when you put it all together, it's about 18%. It's twice the official figure. So this is just one example of the United States cooking statistics. Well, let me move to another uh, topic. I mean, you look at, uh, you say, the Roman Empire, and then you look at historically other uh, failures like say, the, the uh, Middle Ages religious uh, discourse and way of life. And then you look at the uh, British Commonwealth. And in their later stages, they were all exporting via corporations the way of life of the empire that failed. For example, you have the uh, Roman Empire exporting citizenship. And you have uh, the Middle Ages exporting... Uh, the peace of God, and then you have the Commonwealth. Can you say that the, the corporations are moving around and exporting from America is hyper individualism, and that this hyper individualistic way of life transcends uh, collective identities like American identities? Well, you know the the thing that's remarkable about the United States is how successful it's been on a cultural level. Uh, it is certainly failing politically, it's failing economically, and it's failing socially. But oddly enough, culturally, it remains a great success. That is to say, uh, Americans love their own culture. They love Mickey, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and jeans and, and Disneyland and uh, typical sitcoms, you know, like Friends and all these sitcoms. They lo Americans love American culture, but so does the rest of the world. Uh, an interesting statistic I ran across a couple of years ago, I mean, to me, it was hard for me to get my mind around this. What is the number one television program in the Gaza Strip? <laughs> What are the pe Palestinians watching 
on television, the ones that have a television and they're sitting around in the evening, what are they watching? They're watching Friends in Arabic translation. Friends was probably the most successful sitcom in the history of American television, that and Seinfeld. And that's what gets watched in, in little villages in Africa, you know, with satellite television. So American television and its uh, American culture and its values, which include the kind of hyper-individualism you talked about, that is very successful on a worldwide basis. And that changes the consciousness of other cultures. I'm sad to say, because I think that that uh, consciousness of that culture is very destructive, uh, especially in terms of things like hyper-individualism. But it's actually very successful. I mean, it's transnational. It gets into the smallest villages everywhere, and it infects people with a value system that really is destructive. Interesting, because uh, one of your influences, I, uh, I was reading through uh, Thomas Hart. Is that the uh, theory of the cell that comes from a different culture and then it's implanted, and whatever characteristics that cell had originally are... Uh, Accentuated, accentuated in the country where they are now. Sorry, who's the who's the person you were? Uh, Thomas Hart. Who? Hart. Hart. Louis Hart. Louis Hart. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Well, there was. It's an old book. I mean, it's 1955, and he essentially said that America was always capitalist in the Lockean individualist mode. So maybe what they're doing now is they're exporting it around the world. I mean, it... Yeah, I mean, but they have been doing that for a very long time. Hollywood has exported those values. Um, popular culture on television, for example, exports those values. So they've been doing it for a very long time. I mean, you see the results in Mexico. You can see the result. The Americanization of Mexico has been the topic of, you know, quite a few books by Mexican authors talking about Uh, how those values have taken over Mexico, which was, you know, a very different type of country. It wasn't based on Anglo-Saxon uh, possessive individualism. It was based on a Catholic Latin model of tradition and human relationship. And you see how that's being torn up in Mexico. That strikes me as being a terrible loss for Mexico, this whole notion of let's emulate the United States. Sure, but I mean, that has always been a, a fantasy of Mexicans, especially the ones that live in the North, to try to be like the U.S. But, I mean, I would also ask you, do you think this uh, over-involvement of the U.S. in Mexican affairs, do you think that's part of the, uh, the over-expansion we were talking about that's hap that happens when empires are in their later stages? Yeah, but it was happening in earlier stages as well. After all, it was Porfirio Diaz who said, you know, the problem is tan cerca de los Estados Unidos. Tan lejos de Dios y tan cerca de los Estados Unidos. But, but it's getting worse. I mean, they were not as immersed into Mexico as they are now, maybe. Right. And, and uh, the difference between 1890, for example, in Mexico and today is that 80% of the goods manufactured in Mexico are sold in the United States. Well, when you have that kind of economic dependency on another country, just as the United States is becoming economically dependent on China, when you have that kind of economic dependency, you no longer have any power with, you know, vis-a-vis -vis that other country. And so uh, Mexico is caught up economically in a way that it can't extract itself and be its own country. And the model, of course, that it takes is the American model. You know, it's something like 1% of the country in the United States hold up 47% of the wealth. Well, I'm guessing that lopsided figure is true for Mexico, if not worse. But And now they're taking over the security situation down here, too. I mean, we're being pumped um, billions of dollars to to help mend our own fences, I mean, that's an attack on, on, on the sovereignty of this country, directly or indirectly, as you wish to see it. Yeah, I, I don't know much about that, except that, 
you know, I can't imagine that Mexico has to has to fear very much from Islamic terrorists. <laughs> sure. Okay. So, let me be very blunt. So, is this uh, moral, spiritual, or economic bankruptcy we're looking at in the United States? Well, what I argued in the in the El Crepusculo was that it was all of those things. You know, it was all of those things that basically the United States was drifting toward a point where it couldn't pay its bills. Um, it was slowly going bankrupt, and that there was a spiritual bankruptcy as well in the sense that people, you know, more and more couldn't believe in their lives. If you ask Americans in typical polls, uh, do they think we're on track? Do they think that their lives are, um, that the lives of their children are going to be better uh, than their lives? They say no. And so there, there is a, a loss of belief, I think, uh, within the United States um, there is a spiritual emptiness to the place, that a uh, soullessness, really, that I think is quite obvious. Um, and so this kind of thing exists on a whole number of levels, just as it uh, 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 was the case in that of the late Roman Empire. What did the late Roman Empire really have except military victories and frequently defeats at the edge of the empire? You know, well, the same thing, we call that imperial overstretch. That's mm -hmm. the word for that. And the same thing is happening in the United States. It did not win in Iraq. It will not win in Afghanistan. Um, these are just wars for the sake of making wars. So they they're have, just they peddling no lies through the media. That they're winning in Afghanistan, that they're winning in Iraq. That they're... Yeah, if you read that. But in fact, you know, finally, we will leave those countries as we have more or less left Iraq. And you know what? They'll go back to what they were. I mean, they'll just repair and um, try to try to um, repair the damage done by the American invasion. But in fact, uh, you know, I mean, what, the, uh, what America accomplished in those countries is very little, it seems to me, except to be destructive. So tell me, which of this has more weight, uh, economic or spiritual or moral bankruptcy? I don't... I don't uh, Uh, I mean, if I were a Marxist historian, which I am to some extent, if I were a Marxist historian, I would say, well, economics is the most important thing. Uh, it certainly is very important. It gets your attention, mm. you know, uh, because, as I said, if China is buying our debt, and that's the only way the United States can still stand up, then China basically is more and more uh, in charge of the United States. And so the politics follows the economics. But it's, I don't make those distinctions because what I say, you know, in all of the books that I wrote about the United States is these factors all move together and they reinforce each other. And then finally, there's just a downward spiral. Yes, because if we also take the analogy of the Roman Empire again, in its latter days, I mean, emperors and people in power were just pretty open with what they were doing. And you could relate it today to, for example, General Petraeus. I just saw a video where he was referring to that they should not leave, the U.S. should not leave Afghanistan because there's a lot, there's a lot of minerals uh, that should be exploited. And uh, he talks about bringing the technology that's necessary to do that and obviously uh, indirectly saying that the Afghans should be aligned to market principles. I mean, they're, they're pretty open about it. And on the other hand, you have uh, the Pentagon openly saying that, well, they can support the rebels that espouse the American way of life and values. I mean, isn't that uh, wrong to say in the, in the mainstream media? Well, the United States has been doing that all along, whether it was in Central America, for example, with the Uh, the Contras, I mean, it, it's been supporting, uh, you know, the Saudi regime. It, it will always support uh, those regimes that espouse American values and especially uh, economic values, you know, laissez-faire market e e economic values. It, it's always going to do that. It's not too concerned about whether those regimes are democratic, and that's part of the hypocrisy 
of the United States that everybody sees uh, around the world. So uh, I don't think this is new. The only other thing I want to say with regard to the American military is that it goes beyond the issue of economic values because it has become uh, an entity unto its own. Uh, we pursue uh, militarism for the sake of militarism, uh, just for the sake of power itself. And so there's a kind of insanity to the whole thing that the Pentagon has become its own cause. It's not like, you know, they call it the Department of Defense, but this is not really a defense of our borders. This is not a protection of American citizens. If anything, the war on terror has left us less safe. And so what it's really about, what, what the American military is really about, is the promotion of U.S. foreign policy and the projection of power to every corner of the world. That's what it's really about. The name should be the Department of Offense. Military-industrial complex is the right way to call it? Well, that was uh, that phrase by Eisenhower specifically referred to the collusion of business and the military, and he was right. I mean, that, that really is true. But I'm talking about something else. Huh. Um, the, uh, um, the books, the author that most uh, dramatically uh, writes about this is a man named Seymour Melman. Pentagon Capitalism, and a whole series of other books, in which what he really shows is, yes, the military-industrial complex is a real thing, but this is an institution that's now existing for its own sake. Okay. Not necessarily for profit, not necessarily for um, corporations, but literally for its own sake. So in this sense, the new scapegoat, the new discourse which substituted communism, could be the terror threat. That's the excuse. The excuse. That's the excuse. I mean, one thing I discuss, actually, this was in a, uh, a different book. I did a collection of essays uh, called The Question of Values uh, a couple of years ago, and actually it was translated. Uh, it's available from Sexto Piso in uh, Mexico City. Mm. Um, it was translated as Cuestión de Valores. But basically there's one essay there Uh, in which I say that um, there is a, a kind of central emptiness in the United States, and so there's the always the attempt uh, to project power to cover this up. And so there are a lot of psychological and other factors uh, that are going on in this, but we, we now have uh, just its power for the sake of power because you feel empty at the core. Okay, so how much is this hustler mentality responsible for not having uh, value, value-based societies? I mean, it's, if everything is all about money, then if money is not around, then there's nothing to be around, or what? Well, the the problem with capitalism is that it boils down literally to a single word: more. That's that's what it really boils down to. And the reason that can't be a value is that once you have more, what you want is then more. So there's no end to it. But there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it could be a, it's the basis of material societies around the world. Um, yes. Um, I mean, look at Mexico. That, we have the richest man on earth. Sorry? We, we, we have the richest man on earth. In Carlos. Mexico. Carlos is slim. <laughs> that's I mean, right. But that's part of the sickness. And most, you know, I mean, what you're talking about is true, but in pre-capitalist societies, the idea of indefinite economic expansion made no sense at all. That concept was very, very muted or didn't even exist at all in pre-capitalist societies. It made no sense. There were a network of values, and the idea of economic expansion uh, may have been a part of those, but it certainly wasn't the only value. Mm. And once you make it the only value, you really have no values at all because you're really going nowhere at all. Um, one film, I don't know how it was translated into Spanish. It would have a very different title. Um, it starred uh, Jeremy Irons. Uh, maybe it's two years old now. 
But the film in English was called Margin Call, and it's about the events leading to the crash of 2008. And I would recommend anybody listening to this program to go and see that film. You can, get it on, you can get it on DVD. The English title is Margin Call. But what finally emerges from that is that that one, it's a portrait of the 1%, the elite. But what emerges in that film was they have no values except to continue expanding. That's it. So in, in that veneer, I mean, it's, you, you honestly think there's no culture besides money in the United States? There is, but it always somehow is embedded in the hustling mentality. It's always embedded in that. And there are very few things in the United States that escape. Um, talent, for example, becomes celebrity culture. This is a different form of hustling. It's not particularly economic hustling. But the celebrity culture is definitely a form of hustling. And, you know, the, the idea of a non-hustling culture means that you're doing things that you're doing for their own sake, for their own virtue, for your appreciation of them. Um, well, no one does that uh, these days anymore, does it? Well, not in the United States. Oh, yeah. I mean, you look at China and India, they're just going modern, whatever that means. Yes, and that's part of the world capitalist system and getting caught up in it. But within those countries, there are still traditions. You know, the, the problem with the United States is that it was born bourgeois. It never had a feudal period. And so you can go to rural areas of India and you can see real craftsmen doing work for its own sake. It's very hard to find that in the United States. It does exist. It does exist. So maybe the, the logic of capitalism just... Uh, forgoes culture for economic sake, and uh, yeah, the it's, East it's is really experiencing not, that. Not interested in that. The idea is an expanding profit. So things that started out. I mean, one of the classic examples in the United States was you can buy this ice cream in in Mexico as well. It's called Ben and Jerry's. Mm -hmm. Some years ago, uh, two guys started a little handmade ice cream shop in Vermont. Mm. And the stuff was delicious, and it got larger and larger, and finally they sold it for, you know, many millions of dollars to the Lever Corporation. Sure. And the same thing, the same pattern happened with Starbucks. I used to live, live in Seattle in the late 80s uh, when Starbucks was a single store, and they made very good coffee. Now it's a worldwide enterprise. Uh, it is the classic... Uh, capitalist pattern, and you know what? The coffee is bitter. It's four dollars a cup, and it doesn't taste very good. And this is the classic pattern of capitalism: uh, this sellout phenomenon. Because the whole goal is not the quality of the product, and not the enjoyment of the work. The whole goal is expansion, and for its own sake. So this is a kind of machine that I would say is running on empty. Do you and think that this uh, form of U.S. capitalism is infecting Europe? Or well, is Europe did. experiencing... You know, it already did a long time ago. Europe is a largely a consumer society. There's a, a woman who teaches at um, Columbia University, uh, Victoria uh, de Grazia, huh. who wrote a book called Irresistible Empire, which is about the American takeover of Europe. Now, there is still a resistance to Americanization in Europe, but this occurs on the local and grassroots level. Uh, on the public level, uh, the, the, the trouble that Europe is now in, I believe, is that it bought into uh, the American cowboy capitalist system, casino capitalism, really, uh, without too much resistance. So tell me, is this example of the ice cream you just mentioned, Is it just the outcome as of a hustler mentality that uh, that justifies the, the means for the ends and justifies the uh, quality for the quantity, sacrifices? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, the idea of hustling, uh, I mean, you know, a hustler is somebody who is in a hurry. That's, that, that is part of the definition of the word. A hustler is somebody who's in a hurry. A hustler is somebody who's not too interested in the actual activity 
He just wants to get somewhere. And the somewhere is that he'd be more powerful, have more money, and expand. And so if your focus is always on hustling, why would the quality of the ice cream be of any importance? You know, I lived in Seattle during the heyday of Microsoft. Uh, was, you know, right there. And I remember that the slogan of Microsoft was, now this is informal, this is not their formal slogan, uh, but this was the, the thing that, I knew lots of Microsoft employees, you know, and the, for, and the slogan was, we don't do it best, we do it first. That's the perfect expression of the hustler mentality. It's not important, the quality. It's important that you beat out the competitors and that you dominate the market. And I remember the hysteria that accompanied in 1995 the unveiling of Windows 95. I mean, you'd think that, uh, you know, that Christ had actually come back for the second coming. Mm. That's how excited the city was about Windows 95. Windows 95 had so many bugs in it that uh, it was a mess. Microsoft didn't care. The idea was to dominate the market, which they did. But in the end, if you, I mean, if your strategy is to sacrifice quality for quantity, then you end up sacrificing what you originally offer, which is a service, a product which has something good to stand for. I mean, in the end, it's going to be a failure. It will, except that commercially it probably will be successful. Why? Uh, because Americans don't really care about quality. So crap is what they intake. Uh, they're not interested in craft. What they're interested in is commodities. That's what they're interested in. Um, when the United States infected Europe and after World War II infected Japan, what happened was that people that normally were involved in craft got involved in mass production or they were the consumers of mass production. In the aftermath of uh, the victory Uh, over Japan, young Japanese people were interested not in woven wa wastebaskets uh, made out of bamboo, which had been done for millennia. They were interested in American-made wastebaskets that were plastic. Mm. And that, began, that mentality began to spread throughout Japan until Japan itself became a major economic power, in fact, number two in the world for a while. Mm -hmm. And Also, um, by about 1980, there was increasing discussion that the country had lost its soul. There was a feeling of emptiness that appeared in novels and newspaper articles. It became, and now there's a whole industry around the emptiness of Japan. I spent October and November in Japan, and I can tell you that this is a major concern, that basically, somehow, Whatever Japan is, it got lost, and that America had a lot to do with that process, and it had a lot to do with that process in Europe as well. You well, see. Japan's changing now. They want to get rid of uh, U.S. in Okinawa, and their nationalism is rising again. Yeah, it is, but I, I guess my question, it's true, but I guess my question is how much of that nationalism is about getting rid of American culture and the American mentality? Because that I'm not sure of. Um, the the uh, you know I mean there's something of that there that's true. But basically the fetish around the world, as we were talking earlier, for American culture, American product, uh, blue jeans and uh, uh, Mickey Mouse watches and all of this sort of stuff is very very strong. It's a very it's like a narcotic. It's very powerful. And in that sense, uh, the hustling mentality. Uh, that the United States uh, broadcast to the rest of the world has been very successful. You know, I mean, in that success, the trouble with that success is that it represents a kind of spiritual death. But it has commercially been very successful. Speaking of narcotics, would you say that Lance Armstrong is the best example of the hustler culture? He's a very good one. <laughs> the idea is what you said earlier about the ends justifying the means. If the whole goal is to win, and it doesn't matter how you do it, and even to fake it by taking steroids and so on, then people are going to do that. Um, they can punish Larry Lance Armstrong, but the point is that the use of um, 
what do they call it, physically inducing, enhancing drugs. <laughs> the use of those types of drugs is going to continue within sports because sports are competitive, and being number two uh, in, in, within the hustling way of life, being number two that just doesn't count. You've got to be number one. And so it's like punishing glances, like cutting off the head of the hydra, because there's always another head that is going to make its appearance, sure. um, simply because it's an extremely competitive world. Sure. Now, let's move on a bit to political structures. I don't know if you, I mean, you're obviously familiar with the American Civil War, but if you were uh, lucky to see the new Lincoln movie, I did. I haven't seen it. Okay, well, uh, just shortly. Uh, Lincoln is presented as a saint, basically, and he's always uh, pondering the best for humanity, including the equality of blacks. But wouldn't that be just trying to uh, put him under a special uh, quality of saint if you really considered that what the North wanted in 1865 was the South's industrial prowess and arguably the uh, black labor in order to propel the new United States into the Gilded Age in the 19th century? Yeah, it wanted that in 1860. It wanted that in 1861. Um, I mean, what I, what I argue in Las Raices del Fracaso Americano is that slavery was not really the motive for the Civil War. It became that within a couple of years. It became the rallying point for um, the North. But um, the, the real motivation was a clash of civilizations uh, in which the North represented a hustler culture and the South represented something else, something not based in progress and hustling, and the North was not going to tolerate that. It was going to insist that the South get on board, which is now the way the United States, as you said a while back, treats the rest of the world, whether it's Afghanistan or anything else. It's you have to get on board the market economy, and if you don't, we'll crush you like a cockroach. And so the... the The story of the Civil War is a much more complex one than uh, Lincoln was a saint or that the thing was about the moral issue of slavery. Much more complex than that. But you think, I mean, the South was exporting uh, cotton to Europe. They were making a buck and they were using blacks. Isn't that hustling? Yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a very long discussion, really, because you see, yes, Economically, the South had bought into a lot of the capitalist world. There's no question about that. But in terms of the nature of its culture and society, it had not. So there was a kind of tension uh, between what it was doing economically, or I should say what some people in the South were doing economically, and the rest of the South, the rest of its culture. Uh, there is a footnote. Uh, it's footnote number 41 in Chapter 4 mm. of Las Raices a footnote that goes on for several pages discussing this, because there has been a huge debate for 30 years now as to what extent the South was capitalist and to what extent it was neo-feudal. And um, the, the crucial historians here are, uh, there, in 1974 there was a book published called Time on the Cross by uh, Fogel and Engerman that basically said, that the South was just part of the capitalist economy. And the uh, problem with that book was that the statistics were horribly done, and so the book got debunked uh, very soon after its publication. But at the same time, the argument still holds that to some extent the South really was part of the capitalist economy. The, on the other side, we have Van Woodward, whom I mentioned earlier, and also an historian named Eugene Genovese, mm. who have argued, yeah, that's true, but the temper of the South was not a capitalist one. The society, the culture, was not capitalist. It really was a kind of neo-feudal or, pre or pre-capitalist uh, society, if you will. And so this has been you know, debated to, to a great extent, and what I do in that footnote, as I said, it goes on for several pages, is I review that entire debate. And so... Uh, what I say is that, as far as I can see, um, 
the debate sort of petered out. Uh, you know, it went on for years, and it was very bitter and uh, powerful and all this sort of stuff. But finally, it just died of lack of energy with the um, with a slight edge to the Eugene Genovese camp. In other words, one can say that, yes, uh, there was there was uh, you know part of the landowning class that was part definitely part of the international capitalist economy as well as the American capitalist economy and yeah. that's real but the overall tone of the South was one that ran uh, contrary uh, to that in terms of uh, culture and society. You mentioned neo feudalism and you obviously know Chris Hedges who uses this term interchangeably. Could you refer, I mean, would you say that uh, the United States uh, has moved to a new feudal system today? Well, he's using it in a different sense than I am. Uh, in other words, when you, when I or Eugene Genovese call the antebellum South, pre-war, pre-Civil War South, uh, neo-feudal, we're talking about uh, a certain kind of culture and economy. And... Um, That's not quite the same thing that uh, Chris Hedges is talking about. What he's talking about is that um, you have a kind of distribution. I mean, he's using it in a metaphorical sense, I think, to mean that we have we have a situation in which the tiniest elite, um, you know, maybe 0.1% of the nation, are controlling and making decisions uh, for the rest of the country. And organizing uh, the surveillance state, the police, the military, and so on, uh, in a way that supports uh, their corporate control of America. It's, In other words, it's not literally neo-feudal. What he's talking about is that uh, this there's a tiny economic aristocracy. Um, a rentier class. Yeah, that, 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 that basically is in control. Um And I think, uh, you know, that point uh, is is well taken, as was that slogan, you know, the 1% versus the 99% um, in the United States. I just have to come back to the fact that this is where I probably would disagree with Chris. And he is a friend. I mean, mm. uh, you know, I mean, I sure. correspond with him. I like what he writes. I enjoy what he, reading what he writes and so on. And I think he's a very courageous person. Um, but I think the thing he may be leaving out is w precisely what John Steinbeck said about temporarily embarrassed millionaires. You have an ideology in the United States that everybody subscribes to, whether they're rich or poor. Everybody in the United States agrees with hustling. There are very few, maybe Native Americans who have dropped out or something like that. There are very few that are in a different sort of tradition. Uh, because America was born bourgeois, because those are its values. And those and, values justified the uh, elimination of other uh, Native Americans. Well, it did, yes. I mean, just as, you know, prior to the wars, the North North um, making war on the South in the Civil War, of course, um, settlers in America made war on Indians and, mm. uh, and destroyed them in the same way and then herded them into the remaining people herded them into reservation. So it was a similar type of thing. But, you know, the, uh, I mean, the thing that, um, you know, I'm talking about uh, with regard to Steinbeck and that whole problem is that the ideology is pretty uniform. People that disagree with it in the United States, it can't be more than a couple of hundred thousand out of 315 million. There's very little disagreement with that. And in that sense, in a very odd way, Although I appreciate Chris's point about the neo-feudal structure of mm. the United States, there's also a problem in that, in a sense, it's a very successful democracy and the purest form of democracy where you have uh, the 99% wanting to get into the 1% and, in fact, agreeing with the system. After all, we now have tent cities. We now have soup kitchens. We now have... You know, there are probably a third of the United States is living in poverty. A um, third. This is quite amazing. Are But you including the, the people on food want, stamps? The thing, I, the thing I want to point to about that is that those 10 cities and those soup kitchens 
fly the American flag over their buildings. And so the American remains committed to the American dream. There are very few, like myself, that are going to say, what we need to do is get rid of the American dream altogether. There are very few George Carlins that are going to say, in order to believe in this, you've got to be asleep. Very, very few. Do you see a divide today, a, a fracture between the North and the South? And in this sense, could you see weapons, arms, as the motive, just like slavery was being the motive in theory, and that really referring to more underlying uh, structural changes? Well, you know, the, since, since 1865, the South has been, and especially since 1965, <laughs> the South has been more and more pulled into the northern capitalist orbit. And so if you travel through the South today, you know, what you see is conference centers in Atlanta and Uh, dot-com, high-tech industries in Texas, and largely the South and the North have become indistinguishable. So from an economic point of view, there's still a spirit of the South that lingers, but the trouble is that it has been corrupted by segregation, Jim Crow laws, and the kind of craziness and anti-scientific craziness um, that pervade the South that... Um, make it kind of an unpleasant place, you know, and a backward place in many ways. So it's a complex story, but certainly the investment of capital in the South on the part of the North is quite heavy, you know. So in that sense, um, their, their differences have been diminished. So what's the whole issue with arms? I mean, why, is, why does it look like the South is defending uh, arms more than, for example, New York is now picking them up? I mean... Could this be analogous to the first civil war? Or is this no, just... I don't. I don't think so. Um, the sale of arms is not. I mean, I look, Juan Carlos. I would have to check the statistics, but as far as I know, the sale of arms isn't particularly. Maybe in Texas. Maybe in Texas, but uh, it's it's the roughest. It's the craziest state we have. But internationally, um, arms sales are enormous. Uh, you don't have to single out the South for that. 50% of American households own at least one weapon. Um, this is quite amazing when you think about it. You know, uh, over the last few years, the number of homicides in England amounted to 35. 35. In the United States, what is it, 11,000 a year? So I, don't, I can't remember the latest data, but the homicide rate from guns is enormous. Um, so... This is a nationwide problem, not a southern problem. And um, the, uh, the rush to buy guns after the Newtown massacre because of the fear that Obama was going to restrict um, you know, gun sales and so on, uh, the, nation, the, the fervor to run out and buy guns, as far as I know, was not just a southern phenomenon. It was a nationwide phenomenon. Okay, so it's not a, a debate like... I, I don't think, I mean, it does exist, um, but, you know, there are secessionist movements across the United States. For example, one of the strongest success, secessionist movements in the United States is the state of Vermont, which is in New England. Um, and recently, 20 states presented petitions to the president to secede. 20 states. 20 20 out of 50. That's 40%. Yeah, presented petitions to secede. So the desire, I think, to, to leave the Union is, uh, I would say, certainly as strong as Vermont, as it is in Texas, but the politics of Vermont are very different from the politics of Texas. So, um, you know, there, there, is a, uh, there is definitely uh, a desire to be free of the, of, of the U.S. government but for different motives in different places. Maybe economic? Uh, well, that, that serves as a factor, but I think that um, there are other factors as well. In, um, in uh, Vermont, it, was, uh, it has been to move away from a, a corporate um, consumer culture. 
So, uh, taking all of this into account, what do you think of the uh, most recent Obama's uh, second inauguration speak? Is that just a rhetorical demagogy, or just he's, he's a very he's a very good speaker? I mean, we've all learned to know that, but um, I guess I have an impatience with the left, whatever that is in the United States, or so-called progressives, in getting excited about now about any talk that he would give. You know, in 2009, he gave a talk that immigration laws have to be fixed and we have to stop the deportation of uh, Mexicans, illegal aliens in the mm -hmm. United States, back to Mexico. Following that talk, one million Mexicans were deported back to, the, back to Mexico within 12 months of that, of that talk. So... Uh, he has shown over and over again. I mean, I could give lots of examples of the duplicity, but he has shown over and over again that he not only says one thing and does the other, he says one thing and does the opposite. And so when, you know, the left or liberals or whoever they are in the United States say, oh, look at this, he's talking about climate change now in <laughs> this, in this um, inaugural address, or whatever progressive thing they can latch on to, It's clutching its straws. This guy's personal record has never been a left-wing record. It has never been on the side of poor people. It has never been on the side of the environment. And none of that exists in his record. And so where they're getting the notion, because he's a Democratic candidate or president, uh, and he's black, that somehow he's on their side. This is clutching at straws. This is a complete illusion. And I think that by 2016, when his, this next four-year period, this second administration, second part of his administration ends, uh, it'll be clear that, um, that he didn't really, he doesn't have a conscience and he doesn't have a soul. And it's all about just talk for political advantage. That will be clear then. It's clear to me now. Chris Hedges was referring to, to him. Then. The Sorry. only problem is Sorry. that progressives and the left in the United States are so stupid and so desperate that they will then find another candidate, probably Hillary Clinton, who is a real warmonger. Huh. They will clutch onto the next person and say, oh, but this person is going to make a change. And what I'm waiting for is the day when all these people wake up and they say, you know, it doesn't matter who's in the White House because the person in the White House is a puppet. It's not the person who actually is in control. Yeah, Chris had just referred to uh, Obama as a black <laughs> brand, as a puppet for the corporations. Yeah, that's all, that's all he is. It's all he ever was. He made sure, after all, After the crash of 2008, under his administration, something like $19 trillion, that is $19 million million, got transferred to the banking industry. Those are his friends, Goldman Sachs. After the inauguration, he did not walk through the streets like Jimmy Carter did. He went to fancy, um, very expensive, very wealthy parties. Those are his friends. And this notion that somehow you can pull out from this person, who really is a kind of empty shell, you can pull out of him a left-wing agenda. I mean, I keep waiting for the left to wake up, and they never do. And that's why I say in 2016, they're going to be all agog about Hillary Clinton. And he was chosen for his rhetorical abilities, maybe. Well, that helps a lot, but a lot of people, especially the left, a lot of people are fooled by words. And what do you think about the death of the liberal class, according to Chris Hedges, that there's nothing to stand for in that veneer? Well, you know, the Canadian writer Michael Ignatieff once said that, the, and he lived for many years, of course, in the United States. I think he taught at Harvard. Um, but Ignatieff said the difference between the Democratic and Republican parties is the difference between empire and empire light. Empire light means you're doing the same thing, it's just that the language is a bit different. And I think that's what uh, Chris is referring to. 
I remember Gore Vidal, mm. uh, the great American writer, Oof. recently died. Amazing. Gore Vidal made the statement that in the United States, it's easy to understand the politics of America. There's one political party with two right wings. <laughs> well, uh, we're uh, reaching to the final stage of the interview. You mentioned uh, very much the concept of the long durée. And yeah. you've mentioned uh, Braudel and Wallerstein. And uh, the latter uh, academic, Wallerstein, refers to the end of a period of 600 years of capital accumulation, which starts with the rise of the monarchy in Europe and obviously the emigration to the United States. Are we reaching the end of a long durée? And is the prognosis of a socialist a system being put into practice by the public debt and the financialization of the banking system? <laughs> well, you know, the uh, World Systems Analysis School, Rodell and the others, uh, Christopher Chase Dunn and so on, do not say that the successor of uh, world capitalist formation, which, as you say, they predict runs about 600 years, from 1500 to 2100, mm. Um, they don't say that the successor is socialism. They're not Marxists, and neither am I. That is to say, I'm not. I'm, I am in terms of certain types of analysis, but not in terms of prognosis. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very unlikely uh, that what will succeed uh, the world capitalist formation will be a socialist world or socialist government or something like that. I think that's very unlikely. But I think what might happen. Uh, is a new type of feudalism, but not in the sense that Chris Hedges mentions. Um, in this sense, I'm somewhat optimistic. In other words, there is a possibility that with the disintegration of capitalism, you will have the emergence of local, decentralized, eco-sustainable uh, kinds of formations uh, that are not based on hustling, that are not based on Uh, indefinite expansion, but rather on steady-state economies, because that's all that the resource limits of the world can tolerate. I think that might be happening. I'm giving a talk, actually, on April 5th at the University of British Columbia um, in Vancouver, in Canada, on Japan as a model for post-capitalist sustainability. Mm -hmm. And what I argue is that they had, a, for millennia, a craft tradition mm -hmm. uh, that was very different from the hustling that was imposed on them by the United States. And the whole notion of a consumer society in Japan, which is very visible when you walk around there, as I found out, is in fact a shadow. It's not the real Japan. And it could fall apart pretty easily, and there could be a reversion to a very different type of world, the type of world that existed in the Edo period from 1600 to 1868. So I'm talking about that possibility. Uh, in other words, people point to Japan as an example of economic stagnation. What I'm suggesting is that that stagnation may actually be uh, the um, path of the future, that what we need is stagnation rather than growth, Growth never solved anything. Um, and, you know, frankly, Mexico could be that type of country as well. So does that imply big interventionist states? I mean, this is what the states are doing today. They're growing, they're growing out of proportion, and they're taking more participation in every aspect of human life, not only the economic. Right, but the question is whether that type of intervention can sustain itself. The United States... Uh, especially if there are secessionist movements, won't be able to control everything anymore. And that's, that's the plan of the United States, you know, it's to control everything on the surface of the earth. And I think that uh, they're trying to do that very hard, but I think they're, they're going to hit a limit. And the possibility of looking past capitalism, not to socialism, but to a very a different type of economic organization that is steady state, and in that sense, neo-feudal, Um, that strikes me as a very interesting possibility, and although I have no real basis for it, I'm somewhat optimistic. I mean, I saw 
in Japan uh, a very old uh, kind of culture mm. that persists. Um, my friend uh, Robert Bella, who's uh, Oof. Uh, Robert Bella, is a sociologist yeah. at the University of California, Berkeley, and also a, a great sociologist sure. and a great Japan watcher. He's uh-huh. written several books on Japan. Um, we've recently been corresponding, and he says, well, I think your view might be a little too rosy, <laughs> a little too optimistic, but I take your point. Um, and so I'm just thinking about uh, post-capitalist formations. You know, I mean, uh, capitalism has done a tremendous, and Americanism has done a tremendous amount of damage to Mexico, uh, and uh, there was perhaps Porfirio Diaz's lament about being too, too near the US. to the United States. But, you know, the, the question you have to say is, Mexico has a very ancient, traditional kind of culture. Which is being swept under the carpet thanks to this hyper-individualistic import. Abso- absolutely. But when, when finally capitalism hits the fan in a way that it cannot continue itself anymore, and the only choice is a kind of austerity because you don't have the resources you know, it's that biblical saying about the last might be first. Mm-hmm. Places like Japan and Mexico might be the leading edge of a different type of culture. And I probably won't be alive to see that, but I might be alive to see the beginnings of it. And I don't, you know, I don't have any definite answers, and I can't say I'm 100% sure or anything like that. But I remain, as an historian, very curious about what's going to be on the horizon, and somewhat hopeful that we could return to a non-hustling world in which the activity you do itself is the point of the activity, not expansion. Perhaps. So whose responsibility will it be to claim that the United States has failed? Historians? (laughs) Archaeologists? Does this have to be empirical? I I don't know. Philosophical? Would, you know, I mean, this is not going to be... I, I don't know if historians make any difference. You know, you know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just doing this not because... I mean, I wrote those books not because I thought I could change the United States. I didn't believe that for a minute. I wrote those books just to have an historical record of the failure. Post-mortem. Yeah, right. Right, that there be an historical record that maybe other countries could, you know, later on read my books and say, oh, well, that was what happened. You know, that kind of thing. Beautiful. Well, is there anything else you want to add, Morris? Uh, not at this time. I just want to say that uh, I, once again, I appreciate your invitation and thank you for letting me uh, do this in English. It's a little easier for me. And, um, you know, I want to wish you good luck with the program. I understand it's been running for five years and I think that's terrific. I thank you so much for being in it and uh, I'll be in touch. Sounds good. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Morris. Goodbye.